guys, this is our first Wednesday Bible study on Philippians. Hopefully you've already found the sermon on Philippians, you've already listened to that. Uh, and so this is a kind of a follow-up Bible study. Uh, as I mentioned on Sunday, there's only ever so much that can actually fit into a sermon. Um, there's always stuff that gets left out. You can never deal with every detail of the passage. So my hope is that, um, that these Bible studies will help fill in some of the blanks, um, some of the, the kind of stuff that gets left out. Um, yeah, so they're kind of meant to work hand in hand with the, with the two. So if you haven't watched the sermon, probably should go and watch that first because that's uh, going to be more helpful than uh, uh, than the Bible study on its own. The Bible study is there to kind of um, supplement that. Uh, also, um, if you need to pause the video, have a look at the description. I've put a couple of links to different things in the description that might be helpful uh, as PDF to download, a few other links for you to, uh, to read. Um, uh, yeah, so have a look at the links in the in the description, uh, see if they're useful. And we're going to put this, this study is going to be in three sections. Um, firstly, we're just going to look at the passage like we have been doing for our other studies. We're going to do that fairly uh, briefly. Uh, then there's a bit of homework uh, and then there's some uh, boring bits or not so boring bits, but they're usually understood to be boring bits, uh, uh, some of those bits at the end. So um, you can watch the, the bits in any order that you like. Uh, before we do any of those things, I'm going to pray for us and we'll get stuck into Philippians chapter 1. Heavenly Father, your word is true. We pray you'd sanctify us by your truth. Thank you that your word does more than simply inform us. It transforms us as uh, we see the glory of Christ and as you make yourself known to us. So the Holy Spirit takes your word and works it in our hearts so that we grow to be more like Christ. Uh, we grow to be more like the Father as we love Christ with all of our being. Father, we ask that you would do that for us through this Bible study. Amen. Right, here's the first bit. We're going to um, take a little, read through the text, break it up, and then have a little look around. So, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right to me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Um, so uh, first we're going to break this into some bigger chunks. Um, the start of a letter, almost always you have uh, the people who are writing, so Paul and Timothy, you have the people they're writing to, that's the people in Philippi, you have a greeting, so grace and peace, um, and then you have a little prayer that goes along with it um, and actually this prayer breaks into some uh, uh, little sections it's obvious that verse 9 starts a new section when he actually gets to the prayer this is my prayer uh, and here he starts to talk about what, how and why he's praying uh, and I think as we'll see verse 7 and 8 split off in their own little section uh, like that um, so even before we do anything else um, we can start to block off chunks of the text just make it a bit clearer of what we're dealing with here that shouldn't be there there you go there you can do this 
to see some jokes. Um, a couple of observations as we go through. Uh, first one is that Paul's not writing this on his own. You'll notice that we've got Timothy uh, here with his, uh, with uh, Paul. He's writing. It's not unusual. Uh, in fact, uh, two Corinthians, Colossians, one Thessalonians, two Thessalonians, and uh, Philemon are all co-written with. Paul and Timothy, uh, and in the case of Thessalonians with uh, Silvanus as well. Um, we see Paul and Timothy writing together. Um, uh, if you're up for a challenge, you can spend some time reading and wondering about what that does to the issue of authorship, but um, we won't talk about that just now. Um, next thing to draw your attention to, um, Paul often starts his letters by telling everyone that he's an apostle of Christ, but here he calls him and Timothy servants. Now obviously Timothy's not an apostle so he can't use the word apostle but I think there's something more going on with this word servant uh, and we get a clue of that a bit further down uh, with the overseers and deacons. This is Philipp Philippians is the only letter in the New Testament which is addressed to overseers and deacons. Um, mostly the other letters are just addressed just to the church so to the church of Philippi to the church of Colossae or someone else That's a, but Paul includes that he's writing to deacons and elders overseas and elders are the same thing uh, overseers and, and deacons uh, and they are servants of the church and so it's no surprise that Paul would call himself a servant to kind of align himself and, and show that he's a servant just like the elders and the deacons are in fact, as we go through the rest of Philippians, we'll see that serving is a is a pretty big theme that goes all the way through. Um, notice that these three lines here are quite repetitive. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Kizzy, that could be written much more efficiently. <laughs> Um, I always thank God with joy when I remember you, something like that. Uh, but, but you see, Paul is not just about writing a, a kind of sterile statement of what he's meaning to say. He's conveying a relationship, this deep thanks that he has to God, his beloved memories of the uh, Philippians, his joy, uh, or his kind of prayers that are doused in joy. Uh, can you see there's a relationship that's expressed here that, that wouldn't be expressed with just a bit of I often pray for you. Uh, another pattern we see uh, is this theme of partnership in the gospel. Um, same idea as this thing of you sharing God's grace with me in verse 7. Uh, again that's going to be a big theme, partnership in the gospel. What you'll often find here in other letters is the first half of a chapter of a letter um, conveys some of the kind of big themes that will be unfolded in the letter. And that's what we see happening here. Service, partnership, all those things will get unpacked um, as we carry on through the letter. Uh, notice uh, a couple of references to the day of Christ Jesus day of Christ there's a future aspect that Paul is looking forward to and he doesn't just call it judgment day or the end of the world um, for Paul at least as he's writing to the Philippians at the moment he wants them to associate that day not just with judgment not just with the end of time but with Christ it's not just a day it's not even primarily a day of judgment it is primarily a day of Christ Christ is the centre of that day and that's what should motivate our approach to that day. We don't approach that day biting our fingernails out of nervousness because it is a day of judgement. We approach that day with this great hope because it is a day of Christ and we know that we are in Christ Jesus and that he is the one who is gracious to us. And, uh, so there's that theme of the day of Christ that kind of uh, goes through. Uh, another thing, um, let's change this, make this red for a change. Um, notice Paul's 
affections uh, to the Colossians. We've seen it a little bit with this joy and this remembering, um, but his right, his, the way he feels this way about them, he has them in my heart. Uh, and then he says a very solemn thing, God himself can testify how I long for all of you. We get a glimpse, don't we, of what we should feel for our brothers and sisters. Could any of those things be said about the way that you feel about your brothers and sisters in Parkstone Church? Do you long for them? Do you have joy when you pray for them? Do you long for them with the affection of Christ Jesus? I suspect we've all got work to do in the way that we love our brothers and sisters and and. Uh, and, and have joy and memories of them uh, and then we get to the prayer itself at the bottom this is my prayer uh, if we move this down a little bit we can draw some arrows um, like we have been doing uh, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that and then you see we're told two reasons so that you may be pure and blameless on the day of Christ uh, sorry, 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 so that you may be able to discern what is best and you may be pure and blameless on the day of Christ what does being pure and blameless look like it looks like being filled with the fruit of righteousness the fruit that comes through Jesus Christ and this whole prayer can you see this whole prayer I would suggest is all about glory and praise to God not just the last line or anything like that I think his whole prayer is focused on God receiving all the glory because of what is happening in the lives of the Philippians so, so there we go again this is not a um, exhaustive look at the text there's more that you could see please do carry on looking and uh, uh, find things that I haven't spotted um, in a minute we'll move on to the second bit of our Bible study but before we do that um, one last thing to draw your attention to and that is this phrase here he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion and Paul is confident about that just uh, go away and think about how confident you are about what God does I've got the suspicion that most Christians today, myself included, are very tentative and sheepish about what we think God is going to do. We always feel that we hope God does this, we think God should do this, we're not really sure if he will, uh, that our prayers are often kind of blanketed with according to your will or not my will but your will, those kind of phrases. But there are some things that we can be absolutely confident that God will do and one is that he will carry on working in his people all of the time until the day Jesus Christ comes back that means for you if you're a Christian God is at work in you and he will be until Jesus comes back and it also means you can have confidence as you pray for your brothers and sisters that God is at work in them no single one of you has been abandoned uh, to the rubbish heap God is at work in you. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. I'll leave you with that thought to mull over and thank God about and we'll move on to part two of our Bible study. All right, part two of the Bible study really quickly is the homework. Um, yeah, and like I said, I promise it will be worth the effort. You might not want me to add stuff to your to-do list, um, but if you've got any time this is a really good way to spend it. Uh, two really simple uh, tasks for you. First is 
read through the whole of the book so Philippians get your Bible out or print it off a fresh piece of paper or read it on your device whatever read through the whole book four chapters and note down anything that jumps out at you, you know, anything that just strikes you think oh that's interesting jot it down write it out somewhere jot down any verses that are really precious to you um, you know chances are everyone's going to jot down for me to live as Christ and die as gain but but see if there's any other verses in Philippians that, that, that might jump out at you that might be worth really memorizing and then jot down any questions you have why does he say that what does he mean why does who is Epaphroditus uh, w what are all these names doing at the end of the book um, what does this thing mean what why does it say this thing a any questions just jot them down uh, you might not get all your answers um, but just writing and looking for questions will help you um, get a bit more out of reading Philippians so uh, that, that's the first task second task again really simple next week's passage this coming Sunday is Philippians chapter 1 verses 12 to 18 Jack's going to unpack those verses for us on Sunday but if you can find 10 minutes before Sunday to read through that passage a few times and just annotate it scribble it like, like I've just done with this Sunday's passage underline things color things in put question marks mark off sections bracket things together do whatever you need to just to get your kind of thought juices flowing so that when Jack explains that passage to us that's not the first time you're hearing those words so read next week's passage a few times scribble on it take notes highlight it be as messy as you like and then if you've done that and this is a really hard thing try to summarize that passage in under 20 words uh, anyone that I train to preach at Parkstone uh, will tell you that I make them do this all the time because I was made to do it when I was training for preaching and it is a wonderful discipline even though it's really hard work to try and get a passage of scripture summarized into 20 words is really hard work and it makes you think really carefully about what the passage is actually saying and what it means and, and what it doesn't say and what you thought it said that isn't actually there and, uh, and all the bits that you're not really sure how they fit together. So uh, just have a go. There's no right and wrong answers. It's not a test. There's no lottery prize. There's no penalties if you get it wrong. Just have a go. Take the passage for the next Sunday, Philippians 1, 12 to 18. Scribble on it and get it in your brain and then just see if you can summarise it in under 20 words. If you want to do some of the homework brilliant if you want to do all of the homework brilliant if you want to share some of it email me or share on whatsapp even better and um, let, let's see if we can encourage and spur one another on to, to really dig into philippians and make this a, a profitable series right third bit of the bible study um i've called this the boring bits i've put them at the end so you can skip them out if you want to they're not that actually that boring they're really quite important but they're often seen to be boring so let me just chat you through a few um, things. First uh, is the question of who wrote Philippians. Uh, there's basically four views that are out there. The first is view that it's not written by Paul. Uh, lots of people like to say that Paul didn't write it, but they don't really have an alternative. So uh, it definitely wasn't Paul, but we don't know who it is. That's their view. Uh, the second view is that it's Paul minus. So. Paul wrote most of it, but he plagiarised some chunks. He stole bits from other people, and so he wrote some of it, but there's other bits that he didn't write. Uh, the third view is that Paul wrote all of it. He just sat down, sat down and wrote it. Uh, and the fourth view is uh, Paul plus. So Paul wrote it, but he deliberately in, brought in some extra material, uh, like the hymn that's in chapter 2, verse 5. The, and even though he, being in the nature of God, he did not consider God, uh, equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. That, that little bit is often seen as a hymn or, or a traditional Christian verse or something that Paul kind of quoted and brought in. Um, so those are the, basically the four options. Um, you're safe if you land with the, any of the second two. If you're, if, you, if you're thinking that it was one of the first two, you probably have misunderstood something somewhere and you need to rethink um, there's no good evidence to suggest that Paul didn't write it. There's no real reason to think that Paul was plagiarising or kind of um, skipping school when he should have been writing Philippians and, and so he left chunks out that someone else filled in uh, kind of um, pseudonymously. Uh, but either of the second two views are perfectly acceptable. You can say that Paul wrote all of it or lots of people believe that 
there are some chunks like when an author will quote a song or a hymn in some of his works that's perfectly acceptable so who wrote it uh, Paul wrote it uh, he may have quoted a few other bits uh, second thing in the boring bit I'm just going to put a map up here for just for a few minutes just so you can see um, Philippi is over here this is kind of northeastern Greece as it is today um, Paul is in prison in Rome all over here so um, it's quite fitting that we're studying the book of Philippians in isolation because because Paul is massively isolated from the people that he deeply loves he can't get to them he can't stand up and preach he can't visit them and so he uses the heights of modern technology to him which in those days was letter writing and he sends it all the way over to Philippi third bit of boring information uh, when was it written it was probably written 60 62 AD about that time we know that Paul spent two years under house arrest in Rome the book of Acts tells us that right at the end Paul was in Rome for two years uh, we, we don't have a great deal of other history about that most people would seem to think that Paul spent two years under house arrest in Rome where he wrote Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon, Philemon, um, and then he was probably released because the charges against him were so flimsy that he was able to uh, uh, kind of uh, be acquitted from those charges. That's what seems to be hinted at in Philippians 1, 19 and 25. Uh, and then he did another two years of kind of travelling and ministry uh, between 62 and 64 AD, and then he was finally rearrested and imprisoned uh, with certain death impending on the Nero in 64 AD and that's what he refers to in 2 Timothy 6, uh, chapter 4 verse 6. Uh, we don't know all the history for sure, all dates uh, for when books were written are estimates um, so I, I'm going to say yeah, probably 60-61 AD is about when Paul wrote Philippians but we don't know for sure, some people think earlier, some people think a lot earlier, I'm not sure anyone thinks much later than that. Uh, but there you go, you've got a basic idea. There's loads of other uh, information out there if you want to go and find more about uh, how, where, when, why it was written. Um, yeah, uh, and that's it. That's our Bible study for now. Um, we'll get stuck into the next passage, Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 18, on Sunday when Jack unpacks that for us. Mm -hmm.